Statistical computing has certainly changed statistics for the better. And now, with personal computers, we're able to do analyses that people 50 years ago would never dream of doing. In this class, we'll be using Jump, statistical discovery software from SAS. Now, I have the web page open here so you can see that Jump has been around for nearly 25 years and is used widely in industry. So, you're going to be learning a piece of statistical software you will see again. And, in my opinion, having used most of the statistical software packages out there, is certainly the best and the easiest to allow you to really get to know the meaning behind your data. So what I want to do now is take you through a little bit of the basics of Jump Pro. I'm actually in Jump right now using a Jump journal. And you can get these journals from the YouTube videos or from the wiki for the class. Now the journal in Jump is a great way to store analyses or to store your data or anything else you want to keep track of. But I'll be using journals in this class as little outlines for our course. So to start, let me tell you a little bit about the anatomy of the software. So I'm going to open up a sample data set. These are called restaurant tips, and these are sample data that are actually included in the Jump software. If you're not using the journal and you want to get to any of the sample data, go to the Help menu and go to the Sample Data section. Once you're there, you can look for sample data, browse by types of analyses or types of categories, or click on Open the Sample Data Directory, and you'll get a listing of all the sample data files. There's about 440 that are included with Jump. So as you're learning statistics, it might be worthwhile to play with some of these and to see what you can find out on your own. Now let's start with the dataset organization. Now I'm guessing most of you have never seen Jump, but the idea of using a spreadsheet is probably a little bit familiar to you. In this dataset, we have rows and we have columns. The different rows here are representing different tables that have occurred at a restaurant. And so for each table, let me select the first row, we have measurements on the bill amount, the amount they tipped, whether they used a credit card or not, the number of guests at the table, the day of week, the server, and the tip percentage. So much like a spreadsheet in Excel, our rows and columns represent different things. The rows, the unit of analysis, we'll call them, or the different units we've sampled, and the columns, the different attributes or variables that we're interested in. Now, Jump data tables are unlike spreadsheets in the fact that they are structured. That is, in each of these columns, notice we only have one type of data. That is, if I scroll to the bottom, we won't put formulas in the last row. We're not separating these out with bolded sections or doing anything fancy. Each column represents just one thing. So bill amount, this column only has bill amounts in it. Now this is different than spreadsheets we use often because we can get kind of fancy with unstructured spreadsheets in Excel. I know a lot of mine are pretty fancy. In fact, your schedule for the class is just an Excel spreadsheet. But in Jump, we're pretty structured about how we enter the data. And so in Jump, every row is meant to be an individual unit, usually an individual person, and each column represents some variable we've measured those individuals on. All right, so looking to the left here, you'll see we have a couple different sections, things you wouldn't normally find in a typical spreadsheet. In the top, we have the name of the file, just restaurant tips. We have its location. We even have a little reference here, so you can actually find these data again. Now, the little red triangles here, and I'll talk about the red triangles a lot, these are actually little buttons you can click. They're menus. And what's stored here are scripts. So if I run a script, this will actually bring up an analysis, and it'll do this dynamically for us. Let me close that. So we can save scripts to our data table, and you'll find our data tables will typically have some scripts saved to them. Now the next section is a columns list. Now this is actually the same list of columns we have at the top of the spreadsheet, or at the top of the data table. I can select columns here, I'll hold down the shift key and select a few, and notice that it's selected in the data table as well. So this is just an identity, this is the same as the row on the top that holds our column names. What's handy about this list here is we can do other things in the columns list. If I select a few columns, I can right click and I can group these. So I'll do group columns. This is actually really convenient when we have very, very big data sets, so lots and lots of columns. And sometimes it's easier to have them in groups. Let me select the group again and I'll go to ungroup columns. Now at the very bottom, you'll see we have a listing of our rows. That is how many rows we have in the data table, how many rows we currently have selected. Notice if I select more rows, it'll show me the ones that I have selected. We have a number of excluded rows, hidden rows, and labeled rows. We'll talk about exclusions, hiding, and labeling in a little bit, but notice that if we need to exclude anything in the data set, we can simply select the rows, right click, and then select hide and exclude. 
What this will do is hide those rows when we perform analyses and exclude their data from any calculations we make. This is equivalent to deleting these rows from our data table, but often in statistics we need to exclude things, but we really don't want to delete them. So again, selecting rows here, I can just right click and go back to hide and exclude, and I'll let it bring them back into the data set. Now before we go any further, let's take a moment to think about the types of measurements we have in this data set. For instance, bill amount, tip amount, and credit card. Right, two of these are in dollars, and one of these is just yeses and no. Now look at the left-hand side. You'll probably recognize some of these symbols. These are actually the symbols I used when I was talking about scales of measurement. And in fact, they map on directly to something in Jump called modeling type. For instance, if I click on this little red histogram, notice it gives me the option, and actually is currently selected, that this credit card is being treated, this column is being treated as nominal measurements. On the other hand, tip amount and bill amount are being treated as continuous measurements. Jump will actually pay attention to what modeling type we have selected in order to help us create the right type of output or analyses. Now, in addition to modeling type, there are other properties of columns. And to get to the column properties, simply select a column, either in the columns list at the top or in the list on the side, and go down to column info. Column info will contain all the properties and settings for a particular column. Let's look at what we have for tip amount. Right now, tip amount is stored as numeric. Now, let's keep this separate from modeling type. Data type is really what the values are stored in the underlying architecture of Jump. Are they numeric data stored as actual numbers, or are they stored as characters? Now, row state we'll come back to later. Don't worry about that one. But for now, notice we can store things in Jump as numbers or as characters. Modeling type, which is what we saw when we clicked on the icon on the left, is how we want Jump to analyze these data. Now, notice, we can tell Jump we want to treat tip amount as categories, and that will have certain consequences for us when we start visualizing or analyzing data. We'll come back to that, but notice that Jump is going to suggest a continuous modeling type whenever it comes across numeric data. So if you're importing new data or entering in data yourself, if you enter in numbers, Jump will think that those numbers have a true meaning or connection to an underlying scale. If they don't, for instance, if you're entering gender and you put in one as male and two as female, Jump will think those numbers have a real meaning or connection to numbers, but you should go and change the modeling type to be nominal because we know gender or sex is a nominal categorization in the world. Now, in addition to this, we have formatting options just like we would in Excel. I have this currently set to be currency. Width is how wide that particular column is and the number of decimal places we can enter here. Under the columns property dropdown, there's a great number of things we can do in addition to this, and we'll come back to these later on. I'm going to click off of the column properties, and I'm going to click OK to close my tip amount column info. Now let's talk about actually working with data in general. I'm going to expand this section and show a little more of my journal. Now first, this won't be a concern for our class, but there isn't really a technical file size limitation for Jump. Now, it does depend on how much RAM you have. Everything that is computed in Jump is called in-memory. That is, Jump is running on your computer, and so any data set it opens has to be loaded into the memory on your computer. Now my computer has 16 gigs of RAM, and so I should probably keep my file sizes to less than about half of that, so about 8 gigabytes. Now that would be a huge data set. In this course, we'll never come across anything that huge, but note that Jump will have no problem with massive, massive, huge data sets. Billions of rows is just fine. Now, creating a Jump data table is very straightforward. Like a lot of software, you'll have your menus, and if you're on a PC, this will just be in the menu bar on your data set or in your home window. And if we go to the File menu, you'll notice some familiar options. If I go to New, I can simply say Make a New Data Table. Now, let me pause for a second and show you how to enter some basic data. We'll spend time in class doing more of this, but first, renaming a column is as simple as double-clicking it. I can call this column variable A. If I would like to make a new column, I can simply double-click in a blank space, or I can go to the Columns menu, select New Column, or I can select Add Multiple Columns. This is useful sometimes when you need to add maybe 20 columns, and I can enter in 20 here, and if I click OK, Jump will simply add those columns and number them for me. Very useful when you have to add a large number of columns. Now adding rows is as simple as entering data. For variable A, I'll simply enter the value of 10, and notice that Jump adds the first row. 
there are no rows beyond one. Notice, unlike a spreadsheet, I don't simply enter data down here. If I were to enter a value down here, Jump will assume that we now have, what is this, 14 missing rows of data and a value on the 15th observation. So notice that Jump is being structured again. Jump is thinking about your data in a slightly different way than a spreadsheet. Now to delete rows, we can simply select the rows we want. I'll right click and go to delete rows. So now we're back to the start. To enter in other types of data, so for instance, entering in a string, here I'll enter my name. Notice what Jump's gonna do. It will prompt me and tell me that I entered non-numeric data in a column that was entered for numeric data. Now I can change the modeling type of the column by clicking change. I can revert to the original value or I can click try again, which will give me the option to enter in a number. I'm gonna enter in my name again and I'm gonna click change. And notice what Jump did immediately. It changed the modeling type of this variable to be nominal. Now this is important. Let me click on that little red histogram. Notice that once a variable has been changed to a string, once it's now in this mode where it can take text data, if I enter in numbers again, let me enter in 20 here, and now if I were to go to the column two modeling type, notice that I can't change this to be continuous, even though I've now entered a number. You may have noticed something else. In variable A, which is my numeric column, I entered the value of 10 in, it is right justified, whereas column two here is left justified. Now, left justified columns are text columns. And remember, if I go to column info, so I'm right clicking and going to column info, the data is being stored as characters. And character data can never have a continuous modeling type. Think about it, if you entered A, B, C, D, E, clearly that can't map onto a true underlying scale. If you mean it to be numbers, you have to enter them as numbers. So in this case, if you've ever had a data type set to be character and you need to go back to numeric, simply go to column info and select numeric. And when I click OK, Jump will convert this column to be a numeric column. Notice now it's right justified. And if I go to the modeling type and click on the little red histogram, I'm now able to set this to be continuous. Now we'll talk about the consequences of setting the modeling type. That's a very important thing in Jump but I want you to see how you can go back and forth between different modeling types. So that's entering data, very straightforward. And when you try to close the data set, of course, it'll prompt you to save it if you like. I'm not gonna save this data set. And I'll go back to my little working jump file here. Now opening data in jump is straightforward too. Just like you would in most software, you simply go to file, open. Now Jump can open a large number of file types. In this course, I'll be giving you Jump files and occasionally some text or CSV files. Of course, you can open Excel files, SPSS, another popular statistical package, or even R files. So opening data in Jump is very straightforward. In addition to that, if you ever have data that's on the internet somewhere, or even in a web page, you can use the internet open option, which you can provide a URL to, and Jump will actually parse the web page for the data there. We'll use this a couple times in this course, but it's especially nice when you find data on the internet that's in an HTML table. 